Yesterday, you heard a high-level presentation from Applied Materials about, you know, sort of switching from a technical focus to a business one and, and vice versa. And how do you make those sorts of career shifts? Well, now we're going to hear from Julie Schoenfeld of Perfect Market, and she's going to talk about from an engineer to CEO and the survival skills in between. So please welcome Julie. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julie Schoenfeld, and I am a reformed engineer. Um, but the truth of the matter is, it didn't start out this way. It didn't look like I was going to be an engineer. This is me, third grade and junior in high school. And uh, in third grade, my life was all about creativity. It was all about poetry. It was all about creative writing. It was all about drawing. And it didn't change all that much. I went to an all-girl high school, and this is that picture you want to hide from that junior year where you're kind of goofy and awkward. But I was still really creative. I was head of the magazine in high school. I won an art contest in the state. I was drawing. I was writing. And I, I knew at junior year is that year where you really have to decide which direction are you going. And so I said to my father, Dad, I want to be a journalist. So this is my dad with me and my sister Mara and Claire. And we're on his boat, because if you wanted to get my dad's attention, he was always on his boat. <laughs> and I would get seasick, but I really wanted to be with my dad, so I would go on the boat. So that's me sitting next to him there. I was a little bit younger than junior in high school. And uh, I do hold the record for probably having the most rescues from the Coast Guard, because despite the fact that my dad loved his boat, we were always getting into trouble and always getting rescued together. <laughs> but anyway, I said to my dad, Dad, I want to be a journalist. And he said to me, you will never make any money as a journalist. You should go into another field. Dad, I want to be a journalist. I want to be a writer. I want to major in English. You will never get a job. Dad, I want to be a writer. I want to be a journalist. You will never get a job. This goes on for a long time. Finally, he says to me, Julie, I don't think you could be an engineer. I don't think you could get through it. It's really hard. <laughs> this man knows me. We've been rescued together. So in my senior year, I was accepted to an engineering curriculum at Tufts University. And by the way, my sister Mara, who was a great artist, became um, an accountant. And she was the president of an alternative energy company. And my sister Claire, who was a great writer, became a computer scientist and worked for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> so I think we all know what influence our fathers have on us. So I go to. Tufts Engineering School. Now, bear in mind, my SAT scores for my verbal and math differ by at least 150 points, maybe 200 points. And verbal was higher. <laughs> so I get into my first class, and everything looks like this. And I start looking at those pictures. Now, I had had math training. I wasn't horrible at math, I won't kid you. But this was not my normal default behavior. This is not what I did on my downtime. So what happened next? I panicked. I panicked. I was like a deer in a headlight. The slender rod, solid sphere, moves at 300 degrees radian. What are they talking about? I'm panicking. But I take a few deep breaths. I get to work. And I go to the library every night, and I'm studying hard. And what happens next? More panic. <laughs> and what happens next? More hard work. And eventually, after hard work, and let me kid you not, I spent in college, I don't remember going to parties in college. I was in the library in college. And we used to do work as a team solving problems. But what happens next? After you take one problem after another problem after another problem after another problem, you discover mastery. 
And it's not so much that I am a brilliant theoretist in thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, electrical engineering, um, chemical engineering, but what I'm a master at is solving problems. Because I had to solve a lot of them. And the learning is in the struggle. And these lessons are the ones that are with me today in the startup that I run. Because you can't predict what's going to go on. Every day is different. Every day there's a new problem. So I wanted to share with you some of the lessons I learned in engineering. And I realize there are many technical people in the room, so you can nod or disagree with me and tell me if I had it wrong. But one thing is, um, engineering certainly teaches you how the world works. You know, we had this inspiring presentation this morning by Sophie from Xerox. And to be able to be part of the change that is going to take place in this world by understanding you know, computer science or biology or how the genome is mapped, this is where it's at. If you want to be part of where the world is going, this is where it's at, a technical, engine, a technical background. A lot of people would say to me, I could never do engineering because I'm terrible at math. And again, it's, it goes back to my statement of, it's not about being great at math or not. It's about mastery. And again, Sophie talked about personalized education. Mostly people that struggle at math either fell behind or had teachers who didn't get through to them. And they were not taught in a way that they could understand it. I believe everyone can understand math to a certain level. And that, again, personalized math, if you stay with it, it's like a foreign language. Most, most and in fact, want, um, wanting to speak a second language is on my bucket list, and I think I can do it, although I can't now. Um, but I think that there was this moment in engineering school where I went from being panicked to saying, I can do that. And I believe that if you're sitting there saying, I could never do a technical education because I can't get through the math, rethink that question. I think you can. The other thing that shocked me when I got to engineering school is that I thought that people went to engineering school because they were given the calling. Well, many of these people were better at math than they were at English. So they get into engineering school, and guess what? They're struggling, too. Everyone struggles. Uh, in science, the learning is in the struggle. The other thing I learned in engineering school is that different thought processes help solve the problem. So we would sit in the engineering library with four students working on these problem sets together. And on the really hard problems, where it didn't follow the process that the book told you, that's where I used to come in. Because I would ask, well, what if we tried this? What if we tried that? I had the creative skills to suggest a different way. So even if you aren't as linear a thinker, your creative skills can help in a technical background. And I go back to what Sophie said this morning, is all major innovation in the foreseeable future requires a technical background. So the lessons learned from having an engineering degree and then moving into business have been huge for me. There's also been some side benefits of the lessons learned. Um, when I went to business school, um, a lot of my coworkers were trying to get jobs in investment banks, and they were trying to get jobs at um, consulting firms, and frequently they, the, the uh, recruiters would say to them, uh, we don't think you're analytic enough. Well, if you go to an engineering or a technical curriculum, no one will ever doubt your analytic ability. The second side benefit is that you won't ever question your own analytic ability. Knowing that you can solve a problem gives you a great feeling of accomplishment. And then from there, when I got to business school, um, it seemed like a holiday to me, being in business schools. <laughs> there was a course that we had called quantitative analysis, and everybody was freaking out, except for the engineers going, this is so easy. I can't believe it. Taking a big challenge gives you enormous confidence, and that's the kind of confidence that translates into being a good CEO. And this is the thing that I think is the most unexpected and the most important benefit that I got from becoming an engineer when I really wasn't the normal character that you would think of would go into engineering, is that your brain will change. I remember at my sophomore year, at the end of my sophomore year, I went back to my high school and showed my art teacher some of my new art. And she put it side by side with some of my old art. My old art was creative, stuff flying all over the place. My new art, very linear. My brain started to change. I had no idea. 
And I had no idea what that would mean for me in life and in business. But what I have discovered now over the years of running businesses, creating businesses, and doing engineering work is that there is something out there called what I call the high performance brain. And it comes to me at great moments. It's not the everyday functioning of your brain. It's that time where you need to go to a higher place, where you need higher capability, where it's a crisis, or, or that you actually go to another place and you bring everyone with you. Um, I, I, when I think of people that, that show this skill, a lot of times you see it in athletics. I think that Rudy Giuliani showed it during 9-11 where he just rose to the challenge. I think that um, athletes like Lance Armstrong, he fell off the bike that time and he got back on and he won the Tour de France. Um, I think those are examples of people that go to a higher place. And this ability to change yourself in a moment like that, I call the high performance brain. And what I think is in the high performance brain is the ability to have very, very even left brain and right brain skills. So on the left side of the brain or the analytic side of the brain, your ability to solve lots and lots and lots of problems, if you have done that over your life, it's like speaking another language. Your, your, your brain will become wired to finding solutions, finding solutions. The ability to set and achieve goals is another one of the elements of the high performance brain. And the third one is to be realistic, is to recognize this is the reality of the situation. On the other side of the equation, being creative. We talked about you cannot automate creativity this morning. The ability to be creative, come up with new ideas, that's where the artistic and the, and the writing and the uh, thinking through things of how I want to be a journalist. Getting to know your fear. Fear holds you back in the high performance brain and the ability to allow it to happen. Our, our last talk was about thinking big. We all, a lot of times we think, I can't do that. Why not just allow it to happen? So if you can bring these two elements of your brain together, you can at times that you need to, and I've, and I've seen it in my own life, is get to a higher place. And I think it's really, really powerful. So in order to do that in any walk of life, any job that you're in, you need to take a look at which side of your brain could use a little bit of uh, exercise. And I say work on those sides. If you are great technologists, but you're not very creative, get out there, paint, draw, just do things that are completely out of your comfort zone and vice versa. And I think what you'll notice, because it's what I've noticed, and I don't think I would have had the analytic and problem solving skills if I hadn't gone to engineering school, I don't think I would have been able to rise in the occasion when I've had a company on the brink of going out of business and turn it around and get it acquired, or a company that needed cash and turn around and get three term sheets within a week. It's the ability to take your problem solving skills to the higher place. And I believe it's because it's a brain that has both sides of the spectrum. It's my thoughts anyway. So this brings us to today. Um, this was in Fast Company yesterday. So I took my engineering degree. I graduated magna cum laude from Tufts 30 years ago. I headed off first in a career of engineering, product management, and then into moving into sales. And to this day, I have uh, led three venture-backed startups. I've raised over $90 million for those companies. One of the companies was acquired for $300 million. And today, I'm running a company called Perfect Market. Perfect Market is a company helping media companies make more money on the web. And just so you might wonder about where my journalism background with, went, these are the companies I work with today. I'm helping craft the new generation of media uh, for the major media players out there. So not only did I increase my ability to think, develop a high performance brain, but I also got to be kind of a journalist. So with that, I can open it up to questions. Yes. Hi, Rachel Kent. How do you find that combining the left and right brain expertise helps with dealing with people? 
And I especially ask that because for some of us who are technical trained, we get a lot of technical training and not a lot of people training, which you need if you want to do well in today's world. So I didn't talk about, I told you how I got the left brain side of my life in order. The way I really kind of worked on my right brain, and, and I'm not sure this would be attractive to people in the technology field, but I actually, at some point in my career, I became a sales rep. Ooh, some people consider it. And by becoming a sales rep, and I don't suggest you do this, but by becoming a sales rep, the sales rep job is this. You, you knock on a door, no, 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 you run as fast as you can to that door, and three out of four times you hit the wall like a crash dummy, and f one time the door opens and you go through it. And the process of doing that is somewhat painful, like engineering when you're not naturally talented towards it, but what you learn is to listen to people. Instead of running hard towards the door four times, maybe, you only, maybe it opens twice, because you listen and you, you spend a lot of time understanding what's going on in the room. So it got to the point where I was able to uh, walk into a room and just read the verbal signals. But it, it was just, again, the re application of again and again and again, knocking on the doors, talking to people. What is it that you're looking for? Can I help you? No. And so finding ways to do things where you're forced to interact with people, I think, is the right way, or at least is the way I did it. So, yes. So uh, my name's Maria, and I'm, I am primarily uh, right side, I guess, because I, I studied government, and I, I don't know, languages, that, uh, Japanese, Spanish. Um, and so now, uh, in order to do the left side, and I'm already in my 40s, 43, um, what, what do you recommend? Do you recommend someone to simply go and try to teach themselves, uh, you know, casually from friends, you know, internet, or actually try to get into you know some engineering program at this stage or or is that not even a big concern and should someone just kind of start doing something at this stage well first of all i'm told that the left brain right brain thing is just very convenient but it's actually not exactly true that both sides of your brain light up it's just different parts of your brain but language is supposed to be the left brain so you already have a good start you have some left brain activity going on if you have many languages um, there is a book out, and I don't know the author, but it's called The Brain That Changes Itself. It's a very inspiring book, because if you think about it, the brain has one billion neurons in there, all connected with electric circuits. And if you can rewire your brain, they used to believe that children's brains are set from childhood, but they've actually learned from stroke patients that when parts of the brain are damaged, you can actually rewire the circuits. So I don't believe at the age of 40 that you have to throw in the towel on technical skills if that's what you want. I think there is a period that you have to go through, just like learning a language, where you, it's, it's foreign to you. And then if you stay with it, and that's the trick, if you stay with it, one day all of a sudden it's not foreign anymore. So I say just do it. And there's some great things on the web these days. The Khan Academy programs for teaching math, simple theories, they, or they make them simple. The ones I missed because I couldn't understand the teachers, they're all there, and they're, they're done so beautifully. So that's a recommendation. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Carolyn, and I noticed on your um, right brain, it was get to know your fear. Yes. And we've heard a couple things over the last couple days about where people might hesitate or be uncertain about how to proceed. And I was wondering if you could maybe expand on that a bit. Do you find that by identifying it and getting to know it, it diminishes it and you can defeat it? Or what does that mean to you? Yes. You. So that's exactly it. So um, you notice I wrote panic uh, when I first stepped into engineering school. I think that was probably the, the first time in my life I really got to know fear because I came into engineering school thinking, you know, I, had, I was the number two in my class in high school and I'd never failed before. And all of a sudden I was panicking. I was afraid I was going to fail. And I would go into tests and I was sure I was going to fail. And just experiencing this level of fear, and sometimes it would come true and sometimes not, but once you acknowledge, yes, I'm afraid, and you do it anyway, the more you do that, it's just like any other um, training. It, you can actually train yourself to acknowledge fear and push through it. And for me, that's what I've discovered over, over my lifetime. I, I can remember moments of just wanting to you know, be sick to my stomach 
uh, in, in having employees that I didn't want to show that level of fear to. And, you, and, and just once you do it enough times, the fear actually goes away. And then the fear becomes healthy. It helps you motivate yourself. Yes. How important do you think that a formal business degree is if you want to transition from a technology uh, side to the business side? Um, I think a business degree can be helpful. I think it's, it's but it's not, it's not necessary. It's, it's helpful, but not necessary. If you find yourself in a situation where it's easy in your company to trans transfer to business and it's a good position, I think that's just as effective. But if it's not a, a natural path for you, it, it makes a, a wonderful break for you to be able to get into business school. Um, additionally, if you get into a business school of note, like a Stanford or a Harvard or Wharton, these schools give you networks that become very important to you later in life. And so if you get into a, you know, a top 10 business school, I say go, because it will, it will make a big difference in your future in terms of networking. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, I'm Amanda, your MC. Are you open to being someone's mentor? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. All right, that's all. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone.